Hi, I'm Robin from Rainbow Gardens and today we are here with Karen Gardner. She is a master gardener and she is doing a class for us today on uh, fall into winter gardening. And this is one of her squash that, that she grew herself. Isn't this amazing? overview of vegetable gardening in San Antonio. That's an outline for all the steps that you need to take for growing plants here. And that's that's really just for your information. We'll touch on it, but we're going to touch more on the fall into winter gardening. Um, that's, that's really going to be our main topic. You also have a handout for the planting calendar by the month, and that's online. That's on the Rainbow Gardens website. So you can access. When you click on their thing and it says what to plant when, that's what you'll get. So that's already there. But what we're really gonna talk about today is fall in to winter gardening. Because in San Antonio, the winter season and the fall seasons, they're great for, for vegetable gardening. I would much rather be out there in the fall and winter when the weather is beautiful than in the heat of summer. And summer just doesn't do really well here. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this. Um, how many of you already have vegetable gardens at your houses? Okay, so we got a bunch of people that already know a lot about vegetable gardening probably. If you have a garden, you just learn as you go along a lot of the times. Um, so fall into winter, a few basics to begin with. There are six things that plants need. There are six over, overall things that they need. Um, the first thing is light. If you're gonna grow vegetables, you have to have sufficient light, especially for plants that have a blossom and then produce a fruit. So a tomato has a blossom, then produces a fruit. Green beans have a blossom, then they produce a fruit. Melons have a blossom, they produce fruit. Squash. There are a lot of our favorite warm weather plants, especially, that have a blossom and produce a fruit. The cool weather crops, don't necessarily do that as much. The cool weather crops are things like your lettuces, your spinach, um, your greens, your beets, your carrots, um, turnips, rutabagas. I grew rutabagas last year for the first time. I've never had a rutabaga before. Pretty cool. Um, those don't require quite as much sun. The exception on those, the broccoli and the cabbage and cauliflower, they like the sun too. Um, you can get by with a little less sun on your leafy greens but you want a good eight plus hours. It's best to have direct sunlight and it's best in our climate to have the morning sun because you start getting into the afternoon and it's so hot. In August, we start our, we start our fall gardens in August and things can be pretty brutal. So you want, if, if possible, it's best to have the morning sun. Does my garden get the morning sun and, and a reprieve from the afternoon sun? No, because it's on the west side of my house, because that's where it can be. That's my house. The backyard is on the west side. So it gets the hot, brutal sun all afternoon. If I could magically just turn my house around, I would. <laughs> but I can't, so I just, I just deal with it. And I do that by protecting my plants sometimes, shade cloth, etc. cetera. Um, so we need the sunlight. Sunlight is super important. Um, Water. You need water for your plants. If you don't have easy access to water, you're not going to water it. I, I will guarantee it. And I've had a lot of people, um, I, I've grown some plants um, and given away plants at different times. And the main thing I, the main thing I get back, because I ask the people, I'll, I'll plant all sorts of different weird tomatoes, and I'll tell people, Tell me how it, how it how, you know, worked out for you. Did this tomato grow well for you? Did you like it? Because I just like to try different kinds and I like to get other people's opinions on if they did well. And the biggest thing I hear back is, oh, I killed it, I forgot to water it. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, then their watering wasn't convenient. If you don't have a hose that goes conveniently to your garden, um, it's just not gonna happen. And, and it's interesting, I see TV shows sometimes, I watch a lot of TV shows. I like one from the BBC called Gardener's World. And they're always using watering cans. And I'm like, I guess it's just for the TV show to look good. 
but if I had to water everything with a watering can, it wouldn't happen. Um, drip irrigation really is best um, because it puts the water down on the ground. You're not having a lot of evaporation. It's, it's a better way to conserve the water. So if you can do that, um, my garden, I have multiple beds and I have a pie shaped yard and, and so it's a little bit harder, but I do have drip irrigation in some of my beds and then some of the beds I just water by hand. Um, another advantage to watering by hand is that you're out there in your garden and you're seeing things. The, the thing about gardening is it really, if you really want to do well with your vegetable garden, you should be out there pretty much every day. <laughs> And that sounds intimidating, and I'm not saying you have to spend three hours out there every day. I'm just saying go out there, just kind of look things over, spend a few minutes, find problems while they're small. Don't wait for things to become a huge problem. If you see a lot of bugs, if you see a lot of weeds getting started, those weeds are so much easier when they're small. So, so daily, but hand watering does help you with that. It forces you to get out there, um, but it's more convenient really to have the drip irrigation if you can manage it and you can put it on a timer it can be automatic but but don't forget even if you're if it's automatic don't forget to walk out there and look at things regularly how long should you water with the drip like this time of year this time of year it depends on your drip irrigation system the when you buy the drip irrigation it will tell you how many gallons are are going through the system each hole will admit so it, I think mine emits three gallons per hour or something like that from each of those little holes. So it takes a while. The, the drip irrigation, you do have to run it longer. And I would say run it and then take a look at it. Um, and, and see, are the, when you do the emitters, the water will come out and it will form a circle around each thing. And you kind of want it until the circles meet pretty much. Okay, um, so, so time it, look at it and say, okay, there, it only watered this much in a half hour, so I need to run it a little bit longer. And, and just observe it and then keep a journal. I always say keep a journal. I'm, I'm always losing my journal. When I find my journal, I, I try to keep track of things. But a, a gardening journal, keep a gardening journal. If you like a variety of tomato, you grow it and it grows really, really well and you want to grow it again. If you don't have a journal, you're like, what was that wonderful tomato that I grew last year? It did great for me, I have no idea what it is. So keep a journal and you can record things like how long did it take that drip system to go and water the plants. Um, another thing about watering is look at your plants and they'll tell you if they need water. If they're, if they're wilted in the morning, they need to be watered. If they're wilted at the end of the day, you know, you go out there at six o'clock, it's the hottest time of the day, and they're a little bit wilted, but the next morning, they're perky again, after they've gotten a little bit of retrieve from, reprieve from the heat, then they're probably okay. Um, but, but just look at them. If, they, if they're wilted all day long, water them. Don't, don't let them sit there and just be miserable all day long. Um, when they're small, it's good to water deeply and get the roots established. Let the roots, and then wait in between. Let them, let them kind of get trained to go seek out the water. Um, in the hot, hot time of the year, if they're wilted every morning, then I'll give them a little bit of water every day. Um, and, and a lot of times you'll hear water them once a week and water them deeply. But some of the plants are not gonna, they're not gonna thrive if you just water them once a week in our hot, hot Texas weather. They can, through the winter time, maybe you can do that, but just look at them and listen to them. Talk to your plants, <laughs> okay? Um, air circulation is another thing. Um, plant spacing is important. You don't want them so cramped that the bugs are hiding in there really easily and that pathogens are getting in there and growing. If there's no air circulation, your plants will stay damp and molds and, and fungi, they just thrive. Bacterial diseases, they just thrive in the moist, damp conditions. And we do have moist, damp conditions a lot with our high humidity. 
Um, so make sure there's circulation in amongst your plants. Caging things, trellising, bringing them up off the ground, that helps also with the air circulation. Um, nutrients. Fertilize, fertilize, fertilize. I, I've made the mistake in the past of not giving my plants enough food because I was always afraid. I, I, years ago, I always used to hear, don't give them too much fertilizer, you'll burn your plants. And so I got paranoid about burning my plants. Um, and, and I was lucky, I live in an area, I actually have soil. I have about two feet of soil before I hit rock at my house. It's black gumbo, I could make pottery from it. Um, so it's really heavy soil, but it does have nutrients in it. Um, but as I've gardened over the years, of course I've been using up the nutrients. Um, when you think about a tomato plant, here's a little tomato plant. How big is it going to be in two months? It's going to be huge, okay? It's, and this is a Juliet, so it's, a, it's a indeterminate. It's going to just keep vining and vining and vining. It goes from this itty bitty tiny seed to this, you know, six to eight foot plant in two to three months. And it, it needs a lot of food. It's like a newborn baby. It needs to be eating. So, so fertilize. I don't recommend any particular brand of fertilizer. Um, I know David Rodriguez recommends the 1959. And 1959. That's not a brand name, that's, that's the nutrients, okay? Um, the NPK that you see on the bags, so it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the, the three major macronutrients that we need for our plants. And then there are micronutrients as well that are good to have. And some of the fertilizers will add more of those micronutrients, some will not. You'll have some that, you know, say this is for tomatoes specifically, this is for citrus specifically. Um, so look into those and just whatever you use, read the label. Always read the label, use the amount that it recommends. And, that, and it'll usually say something like this, you know, one pound for a thousand square feet or whatever. So you have to do some math, okay? Um, and figure out, okay, I have a bed that's 32 square feet so I'm gonna use a whole lot less than that one pound or whatever. Read, read the label on your fertilizer and follow the instructions. Oftentimes it'll say water, you know, if it's a liquid soluble one, water every two weeks with this fertilizer or whatever it says, just follow the instructions. And, it, and same thing with pesticides, just follow the instructions, read the label. Take the time to read the label. I know some of these labels are big, especially on the pesticides, but read the label. And, and follow the instructions. Um, so we've talked about we need the light, we need the water, we need air circulation, we need nutrients, and we need correct temperatures. I started year-round gardening a few years back. When I first moved here, I moved from up north. How many planes are we gonna have today? <laughs> I moved from up north and the seasons are flipped basically. In the winter time it would be there would be snow on the ground. I wouldn't be planting things. And so when I first moved here I kind of kept following that. And I remember the first year I lived here I went to the nursery, not this nursery. I went to a big box store and um, they had tomato plants in May. And I planted tomato plants in May and that's totally the wrong time of year to plant tomato plants here. Um, and they did not do well. <laughs> I was working so hard watering them all the time and, and trying to take care of them. So things were kind of flipped. But a few years ago, I read a book um, by a guy, Elliot Coleman, and he lives in Maine and he year round gardens. Now he cheats because he does have greenhouses, but on some of his, he has row covers where he just covers the, the um, plants you just learn which plants grow well at what time of year. So there's a lot of things that can grow in the winter here. And, and even during all the snow stuff and everything, I had stuff out in my garden. And um, my, my, I covered some of it and I protected it because of the snow and everything, but, but it still survived. There were a few things that I didn't protect at all 
and they still survived. I don't know, you know, and we had several days of freezing temperatures. It wasn't just our normal, let's have a flash freeze and then you're fine. Um, so correct temperatures, you can, you want to plant things at the right time. And that's where that planting calendar comes in. It, it has a list of when to plant and what to plant. Um, but you can grow so much here. It's, it's really easy to grow year round here. And then the last thing is protection from competition. And you have critters, you know, winged critters, crawly critters, four-legged critters. Um, hopefully your neighbors aren't over there trying to, hopefully you don't have the two-legged critters trying to take your stuff. Um, diseases, um, extreme weather. Um, so those are things that, that you need to sometimes protect your plants from. So those are kind of the basics of what you need for your plants to thrive. And, and you'll do all those things. Don't get discouraged if a plant dies. <laughs> okay. So we try to make everything optimal. We try to provide everything that our plants need. But there are things that happen. You know, I haven't figured out a good way because I have a big garden. I haven't figured out a big way to protect my entire garden from hail. I can, I can decide maybe which things do I want to protect the most and try to cover them with a tarp or something. Um, there, there are things that will happen. So don't get discouraged. I look at gardening and a lot of people say, oh, I just have a black thumb. And the way I look at gardening is it's just a skill. It's not, oh, you were blessed with this miraculous green thumb and if you didn't get just blessed with a green thumb, then you're just doomed. It's just a skill that needs to be practiced. And you'll kill plants. I still kill plants. I've been growing vegetables for like, well, I got married 38 years ago and we had a garden our first, married, our first year that we were married. So 38 years I've been growing a vegetable garden. I still kill plants, but I just tell myself, it's not my firstborn child, it's a plant. You know, it's not a big deal. Just move on and, and just keep trying and, and have joy in the journey. It's, it's fun to be gardening. Yes, sometimes, sometimes things die and that's okay. Just, just keep going for it, keep trying and, and you'll have success. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about what to do when as we head into winter.